Hey guys, Lunatic Fringe here. So, remember that time I said I was getting back to regular updates like two months ago? Yeah, well, my computer exploded and it took me a while to get it repaired. Plus, I was crazy busy with some other stuff. So sorry. Um, we'll get back to killing Germans and non-Romans soon, but first, here's another episode of Intermission. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on it in the comments. It's once again written and a bit more technical than my previous episodes. Uh, if you want to see more of this, uh, just let me know. The Mass Effect series and its five-year history has greatly altered the cultural dynamic of the Western RPG and its parent company, BioWare. Mass Effect has served as a representation of the company in its heyday under the EA brand. With that in mind, it's easy to see each of the games in the series reflect a cultural zeitgeist of the inner workings of BioWare. For example, Mass Effect 2 shows the company as it's converted into the EA model. The main story is largely dumb and action-driven, as are the RPG and combat mechanics. The game seems designed for consumer mass consumption, a classic case of quantity over quality. Yet what maintained its audience was still the Bioware trademark of interesting characters, which I think Mass Effect 2 actually pulled off really, really well. Mass Effect 3, on the other hand, well, let's just avoid the topic for now. It should come as no surprise that the original Mass Effect holds up spectacularly when making this comparison. By the North American release of the game on November 20th, 2007, Bioware had only been under EA for a month. Mass Effect is personally my favorite Bioware RPG, despite its obvious flaws. Boring planets, somewhat weird combat, etc. But along with these flaws, Mass Effect offers up something that is largely absent from the later games. Complex, intimidating, and interesting antagonists. Saren is a great example of this with his personal fatalistic viewpoints. Sovereign and the guest motivations may be less personal, but they're also grounded in real-world political philosophy. In fact, Sovereign and the Geth can be seen as a partial per personification of the society and ideology presented by Thomas Hobbes in his 1651 book Leviathan. So let's first take a look at Thomas Hobbes, and then how he relates to the Mass Effect series. Thomas Hobbes was born in England in 1588. Hobbes' early academic work were actually in fields such as history, geometry, and theology. Hobbes lightly touched on politics and philosophy in some of his earlier unpublished work, but he didn't really dive into the topic until the English Civil War. Now, the English Civil War is stupidly complicated, so let's just focus on what's relevant. Hobbes was living in Paris at the time, safe but still witnessing his country tear itself apart. Once the royalists, i.e. those who supported Charles I, began to lose, intellectual refugees from England flooded into Paris. Through his discussions with these royalists, Hobbes began to envision a solution to England's political crisis. This solution took the form of new institutions and a new way of looking at the nature of government. Thus, in 1651, Hobbes published Leviathan, or The Matter, Form, and Power of Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical, and Civil. The title, Leviathan, is a reference to the biblical creature described in the Book of Job. Leviathan is seen as Hobbes' crowning work on politics and a major foundation of modern-day statecraft. Hobbes established concepts such as the notion that a government must receive consent from the people in order to govern, and the social contract, an idea that became a major influence on later Enlightenment philosophers, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. At the same time, however, Leviathan is very much a product of its era. Hobbes is trying to find a way to prevent war and violence through a centralized government authority, and this was obviously driven by the English Civil War. So what the hell does this have to do with Mass Effect? Well, let's look deeper into Leviathan and compare it to Sovereign and the Geth. We are going to focus mainly on parts 1 and 2 of Leviathan, because part 3 is mostly just discussing the role of religion in politics, and it's not really relevant. We'll get the blatant references out of the way first. Hobbes believed that a strong central government was necessary to maintain peace. Central to this idea was the concept of a powerful executive ruler or assembly that is essentially beyond the limitations of the laws enforced on the people. Hobbes does discuss the different kinds of commonwealths people have consented to be governed by, but ultimately he states that a strong, centralized monarchy is best. This monarch he refers to as the sovereign. The sovereign's position is that of an actor for all the people under his rule. He has been given this responsibility by the people, and thus his actions are actions by the people as well. Sovereign and the Geth relationship is similar. The Geth have granted partial responsibility of their own individual programs to Sovereign through worship. Like the Sovereign in Leviathan, his actions are authored by his followers, the Geth. And thus, Hobbes would argue that Sovereign is incapable of injustice towards them. 
This notion of complete dependence on the sovereign for safety comes from Hobbes' view of the natural order. Unlike other philosophers of the period, Hobbes does not apply a spiritual notion of good and evil to the world. Instead, his notion of nature, as described in Part 1 of Leviathan, is as follows. Good and evil are not objective terms, but instead are subjective and based purely on individual appetites and desires. As a result of this, human nature is driven by our desires, and because they're different, the natural order is that of conflict between men. In nature, humans are driven by a war of all against all, even when they are not fighting, as there is still the constant threat of assault from other humans. In chapter 13, Hobbes sums up his view thusly. In such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequentially, not culture of the earth, nor navigation, nor the use of commodities that may be imported by sea, nor commodious building, nor instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no art, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Now let's compare this to Sovereign's view of organics and mass effect. In the brief conversation we have with Sovereign, he says, Your civilization is based on the technology of the mass relays. Our technology. By using it, your society develops along the paths we desire. We impose order on the chaos of organic evolution. You exist because we allow it. And you will end because we demand it. Sovereign, like Hobbes, sees human, or in this case, organic life, as naturally chaotic. It is only through the application of the sovereign's will that order and societal structure emerges. In the case of Hobbes' sovereign, this is through the rule of law. In the case of Mass Effect's sovereign, this is through forcing organics along a specific technological progression. Hobbes also seems to suggest in his quote that technological progression is only possible under a sovereign, and one could argue that long-range space travel in the Mass Effect series is only possible because of the Reapers. In both cases, the sovereign represents order and stability under what is basically a tyrant. Of course, the major difference between the two is that Hobbes' sovereign rules by consent, while Mass Effect's rules simply by force and ability. In terms of power, however, Hobbes and Sovereign share similar reasoning, namely that Sovereign's position negates him from common morality. Sovereign's conversation with Shepard also highlights another element of Leviathan, Hobbes' treatment of language. When one of your companions asks if he is a VI program, Sovereign replies, Rudimentary creatures of blood and flesh, you touch my mind, fumbling in ignorance, incapable of understanding. In Chapter 4 of Leviathan, Hobbes discusses the nature of reason and speech, namely how the two are different. Hobbes also notes that reason is an internal function, driven by personal opinions, experiences, and the individual's own desires. In a modern sense, Carl Sagan put it best. The simplest thought, like the concept of the number one, has an elaborate logical underpinning. The brain has its own language for testing the structure and consistency of the world, but we never see the machinery of logical analysis, only the conclusions. Speech, on the other hand, is a connection between two or more individuals, and thus they independently come to their own conclusions based on their own individual reason. Hobbes claims that speech inherently comes with the inability to fully convey your thoughts. And therefore, in reasoning, a man must take heed of his words, which, besides the signification of what we must imagine of their nature, have a signification also of the nature, disposition, and interest of the speaker, such as are the names of virtues and vices. For one man calleth wisdom what another calleth fear, and in one cruelty what another justice, one progality and another a magnamality, and another gravity what another stupidity. And therefore, such names can never be true grounds for any rationalization. No more can metaphors and tropes of speech. But these are less dangerous because they profess their inconsistency, which the others do not. Sovereign is suggesting that Shepard and all organics are simply incapable of understanding because they cannot perceive the problem through his reason. Sovereign also reverses this example when he hears the phrase Reaper. Reaper. In the end, what they chose to call us is irrelevant. We simply are. 
Sovereign is just as incapable of understanding the position of the Protheans as Shepard is to his. The term Reaper has no meaning to him, in the same way Hobbes suggests that different words have different meanings based on different perspectives. This treatment of language also ties into the Geth. They are not individuals, but a series of programs that can jointly work together within a platform. As a result, the Geth do not communicate through language, but through co a collective reason. They are capable of a joint perception, and this makes the Geth something that is outside natural law as their society forms finger quotes naturally rather than through the consent of being governed. Finally, there's also the symbolic connection between Hobbes' Leviathan and Sovereign. To demonstrate this, let's take a look at the original cover of Leviathan from 1651. Here we see the figure of an individual, clearly meant to be the Sovereign, towering over a village. The quote on the top of the page is Latin, and translates to, There is no power on the earth compared to him. This quote is actually taken from Job 41.33 from the Bible, and is a direct reference to the biblical Leviathan. If we zoom in, however, we get an even more interesting picture. The Sovereign's body is actually made up of around 300 people, but with most of their faces turned away, rendering them a mass rather than a group of individuals. This artistic choice is obviously a reference to the consent of and authorization of the Sovereign's acts by the people. In regards to Mass Effect, we can interpret this image in two ways. One, the faceless people represent the Geth, because they are programs that share collective reason and lack individual perspective. Or, it's possible to connect this to another one of Sovereign's statements. My kind transcends your very understanding. We are each a nation, independent. Free of all weakness, you cannot even grasp the nature of our existence. One could argue we're looking at the 17th century version of a Reaper, a group of individuals rendered into a collective conscious, their personalities overridden by the Sovereign. Now, I totally understand if you're sitting there right now thinking, Lunatic Fringe, you're really grasping at straws here. Just because they both use the term Sovereign doesn't mean that Hobbes' philosophy influenced the Mass Effect series. I'll counter that claim thusly. What's the state of Rakana now? Do you read your philosophers, a man named Thomas Hobbes, when all the world is overcharged with inhabitants, and the last remedy of all is war, which provideth for every man by victory or death? As Rakana died around them, my people slaughtered each other for mouthfuls of water, crumbs of food. So somebody at Bioware is clearly a Thomas Hobbes fan. Uh, unfortunately, beyond that one clip of Thane, there really isn't much Hobbesian philosophy present in the later games. In fact, missions like the Geth Heretic Station in Mass Effect 2 directly counters a lot of what I say about the Geth sharing a common perspective. But since the series has changed so much in terms of tone, I'm treating each game as an independent entity. Mass Effect 2's action movie plot left little room for interesting political commentary, and Mass Effect 3... Well, let's just say Mass Effect 3 has bigger problems than this. Like that. And that. And that. And that. But hey, a new DLC just came out, and you'll never guess what it's called. Leviathan! Oh boy, I bet it's got some great commentary in it, and uh, and if not, you know, maybe Cerberus brought Thomas Hobbes back to life as a cyborg zombie or something. Oh man, I'm gonna go play it right now. <sighs> Okay, so big surprise, there's nothing really to comment on in the Leviathan DLC. I mean, I guess you could say the Leviathans wanting to reclaim their position in the power structure is comparable to Hobbesian notions of the right to rule, but that's giving the writers way too much credit. No, it's clear to me what the writers' intentions was when they made Leviathan, to drive me mad by making Mass Effect 3's plot even dumber. And my god, did they succeed. Christ, I need a drink. <sighs>